afternoon and many thanks for keeping it NTV Uganda. My name is Romy Busiku and today on the show we are going to be discussing the impact of COVID-19 on people with disabilities, especially the women and girls. How have they been faring uh, since the uh, COVID-19 lockdown was instituted in Uganda? Well, the global pandemic that is COVID-19 took the world by storm and it did not only affect how we work, but also how we lead our day-to-day -day lives. Now, while we are all coping with the effects or the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, women with disabilities are still struggling with the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic with no end in sight. So many issues to do with the neglect from the government and so forth. Young women who have been uh, focusing on small income generating activities to make a living have had to actually suffer hunger, starvation in their homes because they couldn't sustain themselves as far as work is concerned. And we shall not only be discussing that issue, we also have the issue of uh, technology. As we instituted the lockdown, so, so as to uh, ward off the spread and contraction of the coronavirus, we saw the use of technology mobile phones, television sets, radios, and so forth. Many people wanted to keep their businesses afloat, their work afloat, and relationships afloat, and they were able to do that with the use of technology. But technology did little for people with disabilities. Why? Because many of them were technologically illiterate, they were digitally illiterate, and many of them did not have the money to even get the tools that they need to continue with their lives during the COVID-19 pandemic. So right here on the show, we are going to be discussing that and a lot more. Not only the economic consequence of the lockdown, but also the political consequence of that uh, lockdown and the COVID-19 pandemic. We are in the season of elections. How are the people with disabilities faring? Have they been participating in this electoral process? Those are some of the questions we are going to be answering right here on this show. We have a documentary that was put together by NTV Uganda, uh, courtesy of uh, Womankind UK and uh, the National Union for Women uh, with Disabilities of Uganda. We shall be bringing you that documentary right after I introduce my panelists who join me right now in the studio. From left to right, I do have uh, Miss Florence Nightingale. Mukasa. Miss Florence Nightingale, uh, she was born with hearing, but at the age of seven, she lost her hearing because she contracted meningitis. So she will be supported by Olivia, a sign language interpreter, right here in studio because uh, Miss uh, Florence Nightingale Mukasa cannot speak. In the middle, right there, we do have uh, Miss Beatrice Guzu. She is the executive secretary for the National Council for Disability. And lastly, we do have Miss Rose Achayo. Obol. She is the chairperson board of directors at the National Union of Women with Disabilities of Uganda. Now, before we get into the nitty gritties of the show, I would like to interest you with this 25 minute documentary that was put together by NTV Uganda so that you get to understand the magnitude of the impact of the COVID 19 pandemic on the women and girls with disabilities. Let's get into that and I shall return with the banter on that particular video and more. We'll be right back. From the time Uganda registered her first COVID-19 case in late March 2020, life has never been the same for many Ugandans. Many businesses were closed during the lockdown the government instituted as a measure to contain the spread of the deadly virus. Movement was restricted and only those who offered essential services like doctors, security, media and staff of utility companies such as water, electricity, telecom among others were allowed to move unhindered. This meant that many people who normally only come home in the evening after work were forced to stay home with their families all day and all night. Unfortunately, in some homes, cases of gender-based violence sprang up as people struggled to put food on the table.
Rehmanda Gile lives off Chinawataka Road in Kampala with her aunt and her one-year-old baby Matovu that is nursing head burns as a result of alleged domestic violence during the lockdown. The home is next to a water spring that is the main water source for this informal settlement. Ndagire has a hearing impairment and her vision is also not very good. This youngster is her third born. He was allegedly burnt in May 2020 after his mother's co-wife allegedly poured porridge on him. Ndagire and her husband Yusuf Matovu have been staying in this dilapidated waterlogged house in a slum in Kabawo, Natete. They rented a one-room structure which is almost the size of a six by six bed. This room is also the store for their food and kitchen. At the beginning of the lockdown in March 2020, Ndagire's husband Matovu brought another woman with a child into their house, claiming that she had nowhere to go and was also disabled. The newcomer is called Susan, not her real name. According to Ndagire, her husband also explained that Susan would work as a maid and take care of their baby Matovu at night, since she has a better sight. When she came home for the first time, I asked my husband where I should come from. He said that I should leave her alone, that she had been suffering and did not have money for food, nor money for buying milk for her baby. That she had nowhere to stay and she had almost been chased away from wherever she had been. I then allowed her to stay with us. However, Nagira said, that her husband and Susan later started behaving in a suspicious manner. She says they spent most of the time playing cards together, even when she would be the one doing the house chores. We used to have fun while watching TV together as a family. And whenever I would prepare food, I would serve both of them, Rehema and Yasin. We did chat and tell stories. In the second month of the lockdown, May, Ndagire recalls that one night her husband joined Susan and her baby who were sleeping on the floor. My husband and I have been in love for some time, but when Susan joined us, I suspected they were in a relationship. Even when I shared a bed with my husband on about three occasions, I found him also sharing a bed with Susan on the floor in the morning. She says that she wondered why the guy had to sleep with her. Susan responds saying that the baby was sick at the time and asked the guy to help her. One night I asked Yasin to join me on the floor where I was sleeping with the baby to help me take care of the baby since the child was unwell. However, when Susan woke up, she asked why I'd called Yasin, yet I had just requested him to help me with the baby. However, one day, Ndagire got glaring evidence that Susan was not just a maid. I later learned the truth about the relationship Susan had with my husband when I found them in a sexual act. They had gone ahead to do it in the same room since they thought I was deeply asleep. But when I suddenly woke up, they were shocked. After this shocker, there was more as the lockdown continued and Aguirre could not leave immediately since public transport had been banned due to COVID-19 restrictions. My glasses broke when I had a fight with Yasin over his relationship with Susan, who for all intents and purposes was now my co-wife. Ndagire endured even after a quarrel. Amidst this sour relationship, Susan one day prepared beans at night and left the charcoal stove in the house. She slept with her baby on the floor near the charcoal stove. 
Susan says that the baby suffocated. Since Susan and Aguirre and Matovu have hearing impairments, none could hear the baby struggling to breathe. Unfortunately, the baby suffocated and died. However, they accused me of cooking from the house, but I told my husband that it was Susan who did it and it was her fault. It died of carbon dioxide poisoning. Susan broke down as she narrated the ordeal. What she is now left with is the birth certificate of her only baby. Are you all my personal dreams? Weeks after her baby's death, Susan was preparing porridge in the same room on a rainy day. Nagir narrates that her hubby had warned Susan about being careful with the baby. In a small room, you would expect that it was easier to monitor the crawling baby. As Ndagirek hung the clothes on the line outside, there was another incident. Baby Matovu got burned. A neighbor told me that my son had been scalded by porridge and got burns. Then my co-wife claimed that my son had been passing by the charcoal stove and the saucepan with the porridge accidentally poured its contents on him. I rejected that claim. Ndagire's relatives heard of the incident and reported to police. But they first got a challenge because the nearest police post, which is less than 200 meters from their home, had no interpreter. They needed uh, a special person who could understand them very well. And upon forwarding it to Natete, Natete contacted uh, uh, experts who sit at headquarters in Aguru. And uh, they came down at their homes, uh, the victim's home, and also the suspect's home and recorded statements. Uh, that took us quite some time because the people were not there ready to record their statements. We had to request uh, from uh, Naguru and they came and recorded their statements. Because it was uh, an issue of uh, uh, child torture. The allegation was the child was uh, got burnt with porridge. People living with such disabilities hardly seek or get justice because it is rare to find interpreters or sign language experts at police stations across the country. I want to, to categorically state that it is one area that we have challenges. Uh, not every station has interpreters. Uh, because if you are to see, we have uh, 18 main stations in Kampala Metropolitan. And uh, under those stations, there are other stations which, which whereby you can find one main station having uh, 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 one, one division having over uh, 10 stations. So you cannot ably uh, find uh, in a division uh, 12 interpreters at every station. Ndagire and the family are still seeking justice for baby Matovu. I want the suspect arrested in court. I feel so bad seeing the suspect walking freely. Every time we call Matov's mother, she claims that we don't need help because we got food and other items after a local TV station ran the story of our plight. Are you all my personal dream? We traveled to Katwe Kabatoro Town Council in Kasese District, over 500 kilometers from Kampala through Queen Elizabeth National Park. This shanty town is near the oldest salt mine near Lake George. Under this rusty roof lives Angela Mohindo, who looks after two children. The gully between the plastered walls leads you to a one-room structure she lives in with the two children. The 63-year-old has been living with HIV since 1993. She takes her medicine daily at 7 a.m. If you get that medicine without food, also you become weak. Sometimes you don't take it. Until when you get something to eat, it is when you will take that medicine. 
we found her preparing breakfast of porridge from cassava flour and boiled bananas, commonly known as matoke. Yes, that breakfast, the neighbor is the one who gave me those bananas. My neighbor, the woman up here, she's a nurse, so she gave me. Then those flour, someone gave me 200, so the cup here it is 200. You buy, you buy a cup of, of cassava flour. As she ate the last banana finger, Mohindo was looking into a blank space, not sure of their next meal because the banana piece left from the cluster she was given by a good Samaritan are not enough for a meal of three. They eat on what I have eaten. Now as I have eaten, I have left for them this span. They will, they will come and then they eat that. Then in the evening, if God wishes, we'll get something to eat. If not, we drink water and we drink our porridge and we sleep. These bananas contain starch and cassava flour is largely starch or carbohydrates. This means her entire breakfast is just starch, yet she needs a balanced diet to help her boost immunity. I'm worried because when your balanced diet is not okay, it may be you die. Mohindo also has missed out on the doors because she could not go to the health center due to the long distance to the health center amid a ban on the use of border borders. She is worried. Because if we don't take medicine for one month, that virus gets a chance of, devo of de developing more virus in your body. Then your viral load becomes higher. Her body could become resistant to ARVs, thus standing a high risk of premature death. We pray that God hears our prayer so that that disease goes, goes away. But what worries Mohindo most is her two children. One is her niece, while the other one who is HIV positive was abandoned when he was only three months old. Mohindo is their mother and father. If I die this moment, I don't know their parents. They don't know their parents. So I have not explained for them. Everything you know is in your mind. I wish that I should stay for the, the years which God will allow me to be in, then I, I, I leave them when I have bought for them something like a plot, or I have put their small house, then I leave them there. Mohindo was a kindergarten teacher and earned 50,000 shillings a month, equivalent to $13.5. However, since the government closed schools, life has been tough. She resorted to salt mining at one of the oldest salt mines in Uganda, Lake Katwe. There are hardly any vehicles collecting salt after government banned movement to border districts during the lockdown. Mohindo also suffers from back pain and can't ably manage this laborious activity dominated by men. Already I'm weak because of this disease. So I started to become weak. Then as I worked there for like two months and I stopped because now I get back pain because of bending there. She now has accumulated rent areas of four months, totaling 120,000 shillings, since her monthly rent is 30,000 shillings. Although the president asked landlords not to evict tenants during the lockdown, Mohindo may soon get her eviction order. Kasese town lies at the foot of Mount Renzori and is recovering from the effects of floods after River Nyamwamba burst its banks, killing several people, destroying scores of homes and public infrastructure such as Klembe Hospital. Alice Mohindo lives in the outskirts of Kasese town. During the floods, water swept through here. It destroyed 5 kilograms of cassava flour and 10 kilograms of Mohindo is among little persons and is therefore disabled. This group 
is largely marginalized in Uganda. She makes carry-on baskets, which she vends in town. But with the lockdown, government barred all such pet businesses and vendors except those selling foodstuffs. A day I can make five, 50 or 60, but now nothing I'm gaining from this carrying is of mine because they are kept. There are many. As a result, she has dead stock for months, making it hard for her to put food on the table she shares with her niece who has a mental illness. The niece has two children. All the two babies are out of rape. Before COVID, my people will have been eating thrice a day, but now we are eating wash a day. Besides struggling to fend for the family, Mohindo is disturbed by unknown men who keep raping the niece and impregnating her. And I'm the one responsible to look for that children because I can't even identify the, the, the men who impregnated her. Such shameless men take advantage of her disability when Mohindo is away to earn a living. This room they are renting is next to other homes, and one would imagine that neighbors would see or hear whatever is happening here, and they intervene. Maybe she can go there in the toilet, maybe they find their man and rape her from there. So she's just there. I, even the neighbors can't even know the time they raped her. We only saw her with pregnant, with the womb. However, has Mohindo ever tried to seek justice for her niece? I tried to report to police. So the police said, then where is the man? I said, I don't know where he is. They said that I oh, have nothing to do for you because the man is not, is not known. In order not to continue having fatherless babies, Mohindo devised a solution. Feb this year, we have put an old plant for five, for five years. For five years, there will be no more babies, but until she is secured or receives justice, the shameless sneaky men will continue preying on her. We also moved to northern Uganda, which has also registered high cases of gender-based violence against women living with disabilities during the COVID-19 lockdown period. Bordering Maction Falls National Park in Moya District, about 80 kilometers from Gulu District, is a Poyo village. Moya means mountain rabbits. Although it doesn't look like the name, this land is fertile and the major economic activity here is farming. The locals live in nucleus family settings. Even during the lockdown, everything seemed normal here. The children freely play with their mates. But one of the children, 16-year-old Dorothy, not real names, sits still as she watches others play. She suffers from nodding syndrome, an epilepsy-like illness which forced her to drop out of school in P6. The 16-year-old is a victim of rape during this COVID-19 lockdown. Her father, Patrick Olwatch, is a peasant farmer. He struggles to take care of his two daughters after separating with his wife several years ago. And the lockdown hit him hard, forcing him to send his daughter, Dorothy, to his brother's home. My brother has a daughter who has a similar case. They all swallow the same medicine. Looking at this COVID-19, things are not easy here. So I decided to take her there and uh, let her have at least a better life as she swallows the medicine. She is traumatized by the memory of what befell her on the 19th May 2020. But while at her uncle's place, the area local councillor Patrick Akena visited their house at night. Without the epileptic attacks, Dorothy is normal and recalls what happened. 
Akina knocked on our door at night and asked whether I was in the house. When my uncle opened, he told him that my father had sent him to take me home. When I refused, he picked a stick and dragged me outside the house and started beating me. When she insisted that she was not going anywhere at night, Akena started beating her and forced her onto a motorcycle. According to Dorothy's story, which is corroborated by a statement police in the area took from Dorothy. She says he forced her on the motorcycle and as they reached somewhere in the bush, he tore her clothes and raped her. But when we reached the main road, he took me to a different route from one heading home. After a short distance, he dragged me to a nearby bush and raped me. An Wodu employee in Gulu took some pictures of the rape scene which the police visited. These are the pieces of her clothes that remained after a brutal rape. During the lockdown, movements were restricted, so the councillor allegedly had all the time to do whatever he wanted and raped her again after moving from the first scene before reaching home. He then reportedly dumped her almost two kilometers from home. Dorothy, who risked being attacked by wild animals since they live near the park, walked up to home and told the father the ordeal that she endured. They went to police and filed a case against the councillor, according to Okecha George, the in charge of Apoyo police station. And even the guardians, they registered it. that how can you come at night to take this girl? He said, I'm a councillor, I have the power. Main road going to Pakwash, he raped her. And then after raping her, he caned her some sticks again. He put her on the motorcycle again, continuing the road going to Watipakwas. He raped her again. From there, he turned back, coming to Latoro Trading Center. That one, it was now coming at around 4 a.m. at night. He again raped her in the trading center under the veranda. From there again, he caned her some sticks. Then he told her that you go to your parents' place. It did not take long before Akena was released on police bond. We took him to Anaka police station, that is no CPS. When he was detained there, from there, after some four days on a Thursday, we heard that he was given a, a police bond. That there are some inquiries not yet completed, that they should finish the inquiries. Dorothy is still weak and her eyes have turned pale yellow due to the PEP she is taking. She is supposed to return for review on the 8th of August. However, there was no pregnancy test taken due to the lack of testing kits. Whenever I go to the shop to buy something, people taunt me by saying I am pregnant. Akena is also accused of raping Dorothy's elder sister. I also heard what people were saying. They said my girl was defiled by the same Akena, but uh, I did not ascertain the truth. After Akena was granted bail, he allegedly tried to rape another woman in the village center. It is alleged that Akena wanted to settle the matter with Dorothy's father by paying money, an offer he declined. I realize the man paid a lot of money at the police station where one of the police who took the case from Guatapoyo to, to Anaka, CPS lawyer, said that the CID from the CPS called the father of the girl to sit with the perpetrator to negotiate for the payment. That the man was willing to release or give a lot of money to the father of the girl. The locals yearning for justice took the law in their hands and pounced on Akena, stripped and beat him to a pulp. Wanted to rape 
some women again in Latoro Trading Center. The mob lynch team was beaten, stripped naked, and again taken back to Anaka CPS. This is Noya district there. Then from there, his condition was not okay. He was admitted in Anaka General Hospital, then referred to Lacho. One of the witnesses said Akena faked death, and that is what saved him. But when he returns after treatment in Gulu, scores of youngsters with disabilities and those without remain at risk. Well, that very insightful documentary was put together by Womankind UK in partnership with the National Union of Women with Disabilities of Uganda and also NTV Uganda that actually, actually captured all those clips and put them together so that you can get an insight in how or what uh, the magnitude of the suffering of people with disabilities actually is now that we are talking about the global COVID-19 pandemic. You also saw some people who are actually grappling with issues of dwarfism. Yes, that's another issue that has also come through as one of the reasons why people with disabilities are not adhering to some of the measures put in place by government to ward off the contraction and the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. The issue of inaccessibility. The washing points were too high or too far inaccessible for PW in that regard. But that's not all, the only issue that we are here to talk about. We are also here to talk about the economic consequence of the lockdown and so forth. Maybe I'll just reintroduce my panelists. I do have Florence Nightingale Mukase. Florence Nightingale lost her a sense of hearing at the age of seven due to meningitis but she joins us right here in studio. Florence Nightingale Mukasa, many thanks for joining us on NTV Uganda. And in the middle right there, I do have the Executive Secretary for the National Council uh, for, of Disability, and that is uh, Miss uh, Guzu Beatrice, and she's also with us in studio. And lastly, I do have Rose Achayo Abol. She is the uh, Chairperson Board of Directors at the National Union of Women with Disabilities of Uganda. Let me start with you, uh, Miss Guzu Beatrice. You looked at the documentary, so many colors, uh, developments that came out of that uh, documentary. What do you make of all that, and what is government doing to ensure that we alleviate the suffering of people living with disabilities? Ms. Guzo? So, thank you, Romeo, and uh, good afternoon, viewers. Uh, maybe I can introduce myself further. I'm Guzo Beatrice, I'm the Executive Secretary of National Council for Persons with Disabilities, and I'm visually impaired myself. And um, I, it is regrettable that uh, all this has happened. As, national, as uh, you might be aware, National Council for Persons with Disabilities, as established by the Persons with Disabilities Act 2020, as a monitoring and reporting body on disability issues. So we are saddened by the what has happened. But going direct to the question of, of Romeo, um, in terms of what government has done, uh, in general, government has put in place laws policies, and some programs as well to address disability-related issues. But uh, when it comes to COVID-19 in particular, um, all of us were taken actually by storm by this uh, COVID-19. However, all the same, um, government tried to put in place some guidelines. For instance, during the food distribution, one of the target groups to benefit from that food was supposed to be persons with disabilities. Mm. It was even stated in the president's directives and everywhere. But I think the challenge came around implementation, where people who were implemented, implementing couldn't follow those directives. And perhaps uh, they were not keen on getting where persons with disabilities are directly uh, located. Secondly, in terms of uh, information, on COVID-related uh, issues. For instance, the standard oper operating procedures on, and all that, uh, Ministry of Health has put some information on sign language on their website. Of course, I'm sure that uh, not many persons with disabilities have access to the website due to their literacy in technology and maybe even not being able to afford so government, we need to do more in terms of ensuring that those who do not
have access to technology can get this information directly. Uh, if it is on radio, we ensure that persons with hearing imp impairment are able to hear. If it is on TV, we ensure that persons with visual impairment maybe are able to hear. Uh, that is what we need to do more. Mm. And I am uh, saying that what government has done is very minimal, so we need to do more. But we, as National Council for Disability, we are also coming up with a, a strategy on how best to respond uh, during now post-COVID, how disability can be included. Then mm. we can be able to share the strategy we have developed with the task force and we are able to implement. Maybe that's where I can end for now. Okay, let me also bring in Rose uh, Achayo. She is the chairperson board of directors at the National Union of Women with Disabilities of Uganda. Now, Rose, let's talk about some pre-existing challenges like domestic uh, gender-based violence. Yes, gender-based violence that has also taken center stage during this lockdown. It has affected majority of the women, but I could tell you that uh, the suffering of people with disabilities is actually untold. Help us assess the magnitude of the suffering of these people and what needs to be done. Premier, thank you mm. so much. Uh, first of all, we want to thank NTV for bringing out these Amazing. issues. Mm. But also we want to thank the support from the womankind mm. that uh, has brought this to life now. First of all, COVID-19, when it came, all of us, as Beatrice has said, it really took us by surprise. And now we are taking it as a, a new normal because uh, life is not the way we used to do. When COVID came in, you needed to see as the chairperson of National Union of Women with Disabilities, I was almost breaking down because of the calls that I was getting mm. in terms of those violences that the women were experiencing. I was getting from the neighbors, of course, getting also from the women with disabilities themselves. Mm. But you know what is so painful in these violences is that you even get leaders who are supposed to be government duty bearers, I mean the duty bearers, who are supposed to be helping these victims. They are the ones who have become perpetrators of these violences. Of course. Do we have any examples? In the documentary you have heard, mm. a counselor mm. at local council, three, is a leader. And in, in, one, one must have not come out in this documentary. It also happened in Pade. The chairman, local council, one, also did the same to a disabled woman. All these we are getting. So it's so painful that the leaders who are supposed to be helping the women with disabilities are actually the ones who are abusing these women. Mm -hmm. So this makes it very challenging that as Nwodo, whom then do we turn to? You heard clearly in this documentary yes. a police officer saying that the case was reported to them and they were the ones who actually released this police, the, the, the victim, I mean the perpetrator. So what does it mean? It means that as women with disabilities, we are not being recognized as citizens. We are women, and we are women with disabilities. The vulnerability you can see. So what does it mean to us? It means a lot. That even now when tomorrow we see violence on the women with disabilities, a woman with disabilities who is uh, being affected with the violence, will say that, why should I report it? because I don't see anybody helping me. So this means that as Nwodo, we can do up to a certain level, but I think it is a role of government to protect her citizens, mm -hmm. whether you are a woman with disabilities or you are not a woman with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I am very sure that there are many cases down there that are failing to come out. We have just brought out this few incidences. Indeed. But there are so many. So must we make them live slaves because there is nobody who is taking care of mm. them? No. So for me, I think in the cases where we have documented, we need to see justice. Indeed. We really need to see justice. You have had a mother of uh, a, gran a grandmother of that child mm. looking at the grandchild 
suffering because of the violence that should have not been put on a soft target. This, this innocent kid has become a soft target because of the violence between the two women that this man must have brought on this child. So what role is that man doing? And what role is the police doing to ensure that justice is done? Even the community. Even the communities. That young have girl in uh, Kasese being uh, that's raped in the midst of all community members, how come no one raised the alarm? Go ahead, Ross. So you can see that even when things are happening around mm. within the community, are you saying that they cannot feel that there is a, a girl or a woman with psychosocial disability that needs to be helped? Why must a man wait when the, the, the sister is out of the house, the neighbors? You have even seen the, the, the houses, Indeed. how they are. Mm. Nobody could take notice of this man who comes, sleeps with this girl, and then all of a sudden it ends up with the children. And these are inno innocent children. What is going to happen? They are already living in, you can see the situation. So the, 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 the suffering of this these, uh, cousin, of the, the little, the little mm. person, yes. is going to be more because all the time this man sneaks in and produces a child or children with this woman. And is there outside, nobody is touching him. How do we really help mm. if the community, we are supposed to be watchdogs of the others. Mm. Now, if the community people are not helping us, what do we do? Is it because they are seeing that that is how she is supposed to get her ch uh, our children, or they don't see any value, mm. any value in that woman? So even when somebody comes to strangle that person, the person will kill this woman, mm. and then the person will go free. Mm. So how do we make the communities around to appreciate, to recognize that these are human beings mm. like any other person mm. within us? And they are living together. I am sure, I'm very sure that there is something that they share in common as mm. neighbors. Mm. So why is it that they are unable to help this neighbor. And of course we are going to task uh, Miss Beatrice Guzu on the issue of uh, accessibility of uh, sexual and reproductive health services for our people with uh, disabilities. But then before we do that, I'd like to bring in Miss Florence Nightingale Mukasa. Uh, she lost her sense of hearing at the age of seven, but she was born very fine. Meningitis uh, caused a few problems at the age of seven, so Miss Florence Nightingale Mukasa is hard of hearing. She's being assisted by Olivia right there on a sign language, not Maureen Nambali, right? the main person. Well, um, Flores, would like to know your experience with uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. We've given you variables in our documentary, but you know, we know, according to us, uh, your experience, you've also encountered some challenges. What are some of those? And uh, in general, what are the needs of people with disabilities during this COVID-19 pandemic? Your experience first. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, moderator. My experience, first of all, it has been very, very difficult with the masks. We as deaf people, yeah, we depend on facial expressions and sign language with mouth movements. So we really get stuck if we have masks, if someone has a mask. Then the second experience, uh, the information, information is not adequate. It is not accessible. And uh, the other challenge is that our disability as deaf people, you are not able to identify us. So during COVID-19 and during the lockdown, so you remember we had curfew, and we still have it. Yes. But we as the people, we did not know about this. So we moved on normally. Security also did, you know, doesn't know or do, do not understand us. They could stop you and then just walk. You, you, you end up just walking away. And some of our members have already lost lives. Uh, because of security, some of them have been beaten, and some of them have passed away. 
and some of them have been shot in the legs because they have failed to respond to police. So I'm a deaf person, and again I'm getting a physical disability. Double disability. Double disability. Yes, double disability. And also the other, the other issue is information. Really, information is not adequate. And we, we also have people who are deaf blind. Mm. A, a person is deaf at the same time blind. And we use newspapers, we use radio, but as people with disabilities, who are the poorest of the poor, we cannot afford to pay the newspapers daily. And a few of us who are educated, and mo ma many of them are not educated. Uh, during this time, as we talk, there are people with disabilities who even believe that maybe COVID is there or not there, because information is not is, information is not accessible to us. So our request to government: uh, work with our organisations. Uh, to make information accessible to all so that as people with disabilities are also aware and also this can be helpful to us. And the other experience is the food. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and the masks that have been distributed. Mm -hmm. I failed to understand uh, during food distribution they give out to other members of the community, but me as a person with a disability, I'm left out. Great point. And then they give my neighbors behind and in front. So, I, see. I don't know how this is done, but this is how they're doing it. Discrimination. So, uh, yes, I would think of discrimination, yes. They are discriminating us. Even these masks that are being given out, the portion base that was given out, Many of us people with disabilities, we have not benefited. And also, travel, traveling. We people with disabilities, it is a very big challenge, traveling. For example, uh, people with the epilepsy depend on drugs. And people with HIV and AIDS depend on drugs. So if movements are restricted, it was really hard. During uh, COVID, it was hard when there was no public transport. People with disabilities would not be able to walk, would not be able to move. And some, so, some of us with physical disabilities, we usually use motorbikes, but they, are also, they were also banned at that time. But at, the, at least now we thank God there is some opening. But also, again, it is expensive. It is expensive than before. And people with disabilities cannot afford go, come back, and pay that expensive transport. And yet, uh, some of us live on drugs. So sometimes we are late to take the drugs. Sometimes we are not adhering because of this. And then now on education, of course, in the newspapers, we see some learning, some, some work. I also on TV, they are teaching, and also parents are trying to teach children at, at, at home, but some of uh, us with disabilities, it is a big, big challenge. Uh, for example, uh, the parents do not know sign language. So who is now going to teach the deaf children mm -hmm. at home? That means that we are really left behind. Indeed. Deaf and deaf blind, we are not benefiting. And also, some people with disabilities, like people with mental challenges, who are not able to read without a teacher. Who knows? Who has the experience? 
to handle to handle that type of disability. My request to government come to our help. The request for uh, the request for officials in government officials. is for you to come to the help of persons with disabilities. Great submission uh, from Florence Nightingale Mukasa. Now. What you didn't know about Florence Nightingale Mkasa, she's a social worker, she's also a community trainer, she's a counsellor on HIV and AIDS, yes, issues of HIV and AIDS, and she's also a member of the International AIDS Society. I couldn't agree more with all uh, that you submitted, Miss Nightingale. We do have someone representing the government, and that is uh, the Executive Secretary of the National Council for People Living with Disabilities, Miss Beatrice Guzu. You've had all that Miss Nightingale had to say. What are you, has government been doing to ensure that you rectify this issue? Thank you so much. Um, these are very quite pertinent issues, uh, but what I can submit is that uh, in government, uh, we have some ministries which have particular departments mm. responsible for spe uh, specific issues. For instance, uh, the issue which one of the issues she raised was on education, mm -hmm. and the, there is a, a department for special needs and inclusive education within the Ministry of Education, which mm -hmm. is currently working hand in hand with the overall ministry to ensure that uh, person, children with the learning uh, needs are also taken care of. Mm -hmm. The process is slow, mm -hmm. but something is being done. In, in that regard, mm -hmm. we are hopeful that children with the learning disabilities will also be able to benefit. Of course, I know they are already behind, mm -hmm. but uh, that department is working with the overall ministry mm -hmm. to ensure that something uh, l learning takes place among children with the learning disability. Uh, uh, special yes. needs mm -hmm. and, and inclusive the issue education. Uh, yes, and then the issue uh, of transparent masks. Mm. Yeah, the, the issue of transparent masks, that one is... Uh, uh, a bit difficult, mm. but I think uh, there is also what we call affirmative action. Uh, maybe what r needs to be done is that um, whenever there is, where there is a p person with a hearing impairment, affirmative action can be given to such a person to so long as uh, the whoever is enforcing the, the law of wearing mask, like the police, mm. are informed that this person is a, a hearing person and he requires to see, then that affirmative action can be mm. taken care of because it is provided for in the Persons with Disabilities Act mm. 2020. Mm. Uh, even uh, regarding all the health-related issues, mm. we have a, de a department uh, specially f uh, concerned with the disability prevention and rehabilitation. So Ministry of Health, uh, needs to work hand in hand with that department and all other organi uh, organizations of persons with disabilities, including the National Council for Persons with Disabilities, uh, so that all these health-related issues can be addressed. And uh, more so, uh, currently we have a representative of persons with disabilities in the National Task Force for COVID response. So my appeal would be that uh, this representation could be also stressed, I mean, uh, go, go down even to the district task force and the sub-county task mm. force so that uh, those representatives can continuously guide the task force on issues related to persons with disabilities. Now, uh, regarding the sexual and reproductive health, some of the issues which are in the documentary there are really criminal in nature, mm. and they need the uh, uh, justice to address that. And uh, in the D Rape and Defilement Act, it is clearly stated t that um, rape against a person with disability or a woman or a girl with disability is aggravated, and the punishment for it is actually very grave. I think it's 20 years and, uh, and above. So uh, the maybe the challenge we have is how to prosecute such people, and uh, something needs to be done around that area where because it is a general problem that due to corruption and things like that, the culprits always run away, but I think that is really criminal. And uh, we need to use, because at the, at the community level, government has various structures. We have uh, what we call the village health teams. We have the social workers. We have community development 
officers at sub county level so those structures should be able to create awareness in the community on the needs and the challenges of persons with disabilities including the national council for persons with disabilities it has structures at the sub county level if it could be strengthened they can work hand in hand with the community development officers and the other structures at the lower level to address those kind of issues through awareness raising and even prosecution. Mm. I think that's how best I can submit. <coughs> well, well, of course, government of Uganda at the height of this pandemic was mm. passing out messages on COVID-19. Yes. yes, but these messages were not only disability in inaccessible. Mm. They were not only in, in, in disability inaccessible formats, mm. but also they were on platforms that were deemed expensive for yes. people with disabilities. The TV sets, yes. the radios, mm. and so forth, the internet itself, mm. it was too expensive. Mm. Uh, in that regard, what are you doing to actually offer some kind of rep uh, reprieve to our people with disabilities? disabilities? Uh, currently, we don't have uh, anything straightforward. Mm. We are using those, the few who can be able to access the information on the television through the use of sign language, mm. at least in the newscasts that goes on, they are able to benefit from it. And uh, there are those also who are able to hear and maybe know the English language because most of this information is passed in English. Mm. Uh, they can uh, here, but for those who don't hear completely, uh, we have not yet come up with clear messages for them, which is regrettable. Mm -hmm. That's why I earlier on said that as National Council for Persons with Disabilities, we are working on strategies with the organizations of persons. We shall be consulting organizations of persons with disabilities mm -hmm. on how best we can uh, how get the persons who are not able to get the uh, information on COVID related mm. issues mm. to benefit as well because COVID is still here to stay and we we hope that the post COVID responses will be much better than what it is right now. Well, you, you've mentioned something that is pertinent. COVID-19 is here to stay, and mm -hmm. we have to institute these measures to stop the uh, yes. spread of the same. Mm -hmm. But then there is an issue of inaccessibility. Yes. Yes. The hand washing points that were put in place do not favor abled people. And they do not put in mind persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So you have PWDs who say the hand washing points are inaccessible to people like us who have mobility issues. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that's one of the reasons why uh, PWDs haven't been able to adhere to the strict guidelines on COVID-19? Yes, I think that could be part of the reasons why. So it calls awareness raising on whoever, uh, like even here, mm -hmm. you the TV people, you could help us also to publicize this information mm. and maybe even show the example. Yeah. For instance, if we you at a TV, mm. I mean NTV, the, the you can demonstrate that if we put the, the, the sanitizer mm. at a, a point where everybody can be able to access mm. and then it's somebody else will copy from you. I know that that's still a challenge, but all of us can create the awareness for all institutions where they are uh, mm. offices are accessed by the public, mm. including persons with disabilities. Mm. Mm. Well, of course, let me also bring in Rose Achayo Obol. She's the chairperson, board of directors at the National Union of Women with Disabilities of Uganda. She's running for office, by the way. Uh, Ms. Rose Achayo, you're running for office, of course, uh, but then we have people who are living with disabilities. They haven't had a chance or even the tools that they need to uh, engage in this electoral process. Help us understand what are some of the challenges PWDs are actually encountering during this electoral season or political season. Okay, thank you so much, mm. moderator. I think this still takes us to the issue of information. Indeed. Mm. Information is still lacking. It is lacking especially we are talking about uh, TVs, we are talking about radios, but how many of these persons with disabilities have these gadgets? Do they have them? Can they access it? Mm. Or can they access them? No. So they are actually relying on others. They do not know what is happening. For example, so we the scientific are election has not favored persons with disabilities? Completely, completely. For example, now we are in the process of um, establishing structures. And in this process of establishing structures, you know very well that we are in a multi-party system. And uh, the parties need to 
make sure that they have their candidates for the lower structures. But also at the same time, the Independent Electro Electoral Commission is also establishing their structure. As you know, persons with disabilities use college mm -hmm. to enable them get their leaders. So this process of establishing structure is really disturbing because people do not know. You sometimes hear that now, what are we going to do? What, when is the date for uh, village election? Of course, Electoral Commission has tried, the Independent Electoral Commission has tried to still inform people using the radios. But as I told you, persons with disabilities do not have those things. Mm -hmm. And that is very challenging as a leader who is running for the position mm. uh, that I am really going to run is that most of the time people are You're calling. You're to let us know about the position. <laughs> okay, I am contesting. I am a candidate yes. for parliamentary uh, position of representing persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm in the 11th parliament but so of course i am still going through indeed. the primaries indeed. of uh, the party structure yes, yes. Go ahead. so most of the time they are calling when are we having the elections of uh, members of parliament they do not know and yet they are supposed to elect us but even when they are talking about electing at the moment we are not even very sure because the establishment of the structure is not yet done so the party says they are going to use the old structure mm -hmm. But also at the same time, the new structure is being established. Now they are asking, which structure is going to be used? Is it the old structure or the new structure? Now, for me, who is also aspiring, who is a candidate, I also don't have the answers to give them mm -hmm. because I also don't have the information. Okay. But of course, the information that we got, which needs to be confirmed, is that they are going to use the old structure. And then the other thing which is very challenging is really cost. Mm. Cost in terms of... Uh, transportation. Mm. Most of these uh, persons with disabilities also want to aspire as candidates at, at different levels. But you know you are supposed to come from your home area, travel to the center where you are going to pick your nomination form and then also try to look for people to ensure that they sign your nomination form and that requires a lot of movements. Now when you look at mm. the issue of cost vis-a-vis mobility that becomes very 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 costly and of course as people are looking for uh, the political positions remember persons with disabilities only don't vote persons with disabilities leaders they also vote the other leaders mm. but how do the other leaders also appreciate them and also become a voice to them that you know these are challenges that persons with disabilities are going through mm -hmm. how do we help them it seems none of them, those other mainstream leaders, seems not to be looking at these issues of persons with disabilities. But for me, what I can say is very challenging in terms of cost, in terms of um, uh, the, the people who are going to be voting us, in terms of the locations, in terms of the area of coverage. So that one is really very, very challenging for okay. a member of parliament to move the whole country because you are looking for... Yeah. votes in all these districts. Ro Rosa Chayo, as someone who is vying for an MP position, it might not, and you're able-bodied, so you might not find so many challenges. But then we'd like to know, what, the, what about those persons with disabilities who have mobility challenges? When we go for this break and come back, we'd like you to help us understand what are some of those issues that they are facing during this time of uh, politics and what needs to be done so that they can be able to uh, exercise their constitutional mandate mm -hmm. in that regard. Re ladies and gentlemen, Rose Ach Achayo is the chairperson of the uh, Board of Directors National Union of Women with Disabilities of Uganda. We also do have Miss Beatrice Guzu. She is the Executive Secretary uh, for the National Council of People Living with Disabilities. And we also do have the lovely uh, Miss uh, Nightingale Florence Mukasa. She is a social worker. She's a community trainer. And she's also a member of the International AIDS Society. She's being assisted by Olivia for sign language. She's head of hearing. And of course, to crown it all, we do have Olivia. Um, Nambalidua, Maureen Nambalidua rather, on sign language to help us with our people with disabilities who are watching this show right now. Uh, allow us to take a very short break. We'll be right back with more information right here on NTV Uganda. We'll be right back.
TV Uganda and many thanks for staying with us. My name is Romeo Busiku. Of course, today on the show, we are discussing or assessing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on women and girls living with disabilities. Well, I do have Miss Nightingale Florence Mukasa. She is a social worker, a community trainer, and an, uh, a member of the International AIDS Society. She also is a counselor on HIV and AIDS issues. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, she's not alone. She's also joined by Miss Guzu uh, Beatrice, the National Council for People with Disabilities. She is the executive secretary for that organization. And uh, we do have Rose Achayo Abol. She is the chairperson board of directors at the National Union of Women with Disabilities in Uganda. Well, Maureen Nambalirwa on sign language. Let's get back into this conversation with uh, Ms. Rose Ab Ach yes, Achayo. Mm -hmm. You're not off the, hook, uh, off the hook as yet. We were still discussing the politics and the election. You were talking about how you're vying for office, but you're able-bodied. You won't have so many challenges as someone living with a disability. So help us uh, narrate some of those challenges that uh, some of those people living with dis disabilities have actually told you about moving forward. Yes, first of all, I need to correct you, Romeo, that I am a woman with a physical disability. You are? Yes, I'm a woman with a physical disability. That's why I'm able to yeah. contest for this position because... The position on those five mm. members of parliament has to be persons mm. with disabilities. And those with mo mobility issues, what are the challenges they are facing during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, one of the things that uh, we need to recognize and appreciate is mm. that you know very well that we have just been uh, electing flag bearers Indeed. of uh, people who are supposed to represent our leaders. And one of the biggest challenges really, the standing, you know very well that some people use clutches, so standing on the line for quite a long time is not something which is very, very easy. Mm -hmm. But also we are, we are seeing the social distancing is something which is also very challenging. You are moving with somebody who is also going to elect his or her leader. He's visually impaired. Mm -hmm. And the, the social, pro, uh, social distancing is something which is very, very challenging because this person has to move with the person who is going to be, uh, who is a voter. So that is one of the key challenges. But also, you know, in these polling stations, people who are having hearing impairment are also being left out. People are making communications, camp leaders are campaigning. Now the deaf people are not getting whatever messages they are passing to the, the voters. So these ones are left out. But remember also, they are, the deaf people are also are supposed to be elected as leaders and they are getting a big challenge mm. of uh, getting sign language interpreters as you know the sign language interpreters offer services so who is to help or support this candidate now it is upon you the candidate to support the the, 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 the sign language interpreters and we have already seen how COVID-19 has really affected many people and it is worst with the women especially now women with disabilities. We know very well our businesses have been, uh, the, the, the capital that we had has uh, actually been blown off looking at uh, the documentaries that has been, uh, we, we have been watching. Mm. So getting really to political space when you don't have the financial muscle, it becomes very challenging. At the end of the day, you may find that you are a good leader but because you are unable to afford, mm. you drop out along the way. So those are some of the, uh, the, 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 the challenges. I've already talked about information. Mm. Information is a two-way. For example, government came out, uh, uh, the, 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 the NRM party came out with the roadmap, the first roadmap. And then all of a sudden, they have also changed. There's another second roadmap. Now, people do not, because of that kind of gap of, of information, People are not aware that this change took place, especially those PWDs at the grassroots. So now they have to call us and say, you people, we are hearing. In fact, somebody even called me this morning thinking that the elections are going to be done tomorrow. And I told the person, no, the election is not going to be done tomorrow. We are actually going to be electing people, no, tomorrow, not Friday 11th. Mm -hmm. Said our election will be done on the 10th of October 2020. Mm -hmm. So these changes that comes abruptly, and yet the information doesn't trickle down quickly to the members. 
makes it very challenging. Mm. So I think there is need for us to really make information reach the people at the right time. And then if we are making changes, we need to make changes that does not disorganize members, especially the candidates and also the voters. And of course, I was talking about uh, the location and then the area of coverage. As you know, members of Parliament for Persons with Disabilities are elected by the whole country. So you have to move in all these 100 and so districts, mm -hmm. which is not easy. It's not easy, but because you want to serve your people, you have to move. Uh, but of course, it is even worse when you see constituencies are being given more positions. Yes. And for us as persons with disabilities, we are saying, why don't you also add for us, maybe instead of uh, having the five, maybe you make us be ten, a woman and a man, a woman yes. and a man. Mm. And then we maybe make it regional so that we really feel that we are also taking services nearer to our people. Mm. Yes. Of course, we have someone representing government, so she'll be able to pitch in. Ms. Beatrice Guzu, she is the Executive Secretary for the National Council of People Living with Disabilities. A lot has been said by Ms. Abayo, yes. uh, Ms. Achayo. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you have to say about that? Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Busiku. I, I think what she has mentioned, there are really challenges indeed. But uh, we want to s I want to say that uh, currently, government has... For instance, the challenge of uh, sign language interpreters and helpers not uh, being I mean, given to mm. candidates or even voters. Mm. Currently, the government has only addressed that at the, the national level voting, the national voting which she was talking about, that the five members of parliament representing persons with disabilities are elected at national level. That's why they are supposed to campaign throughout the whole country. Mm. So during that election, uh, sign language interpreters are provided for, uh, helpers are also provided for. Helpers means guides of uh, the blind people, mm. those who are supporting those with the wheelchair users, all that is inclusive of helpers. There they are provided for, but at the lower level, it is not yet provided for. And um, the only way government can address that is also by amending the current law which is the persons with disabilities act to to state that guides and helpers including sign language interpreters should be provided at all levels whether the candidates are voting for persons with disabilities or they are voting for the other positions mm. in the political structure if it is stated that way it is if it is provided for in the law then the Electoral Commission can budget for it. Mm. But right now it is not provided for, which is, I think, a, a, a challenge. But that can be addressed uh, maybe in the next election through the amendment of the uh, Parliamentary Elections Act. Um, then regarding the issue of information, um, recently we have engaged Electoral Commission to see how best, especially when it comes to the, the voting, how can the bol ballot papers mm. be accessible to persons with disabilities, but they have promised that in the next election, they will be able to have some alternatives which we had proposed to them, having maybe the jacket, having large print, but they said it is not possible this year, I mean for this current election, mm. but something will be done. So as National Council for Persons with Disabilities, we shall be working hand in hand with the Electoral Commission to ensure that the pledge they have made to us is uh, fulfilled in the next election. But we, we, we ask for forgiveness, mm. forgiveness from persons with disabilities right now that they may not be able to uh, have alternatives mm. that they can uh, use guides. Because mm. right now it, the guides can assist or helpers can assist in the, in the voting process. Although uh, that I, 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 be I, believe, I believe the laughter from uh, Rosa Chayo and mm. Ma uh, <laughs> Florence Nightingale <laughs> means you've been forgiven, uh, Ms. Guzu. Yes. But then help us uh, also comment on the scientific nature of this election. Mm. 
people who have mobility issues yes. haven't been able to participate very freely mm -hmm. and other people with disabilities alike. So what is government doing to create an, a conducive environment where people with disabilities can also participate in this electoral process without any challenges? Um, for the currently, mm. the voting, the, the, the polling stations have been put maybe at the nearest point, well, although it is for persons with disabilities, it is true. Mm. Even when it is a, like 500 meters, that can be a challenge for, a, for somebody who is crawling. But as I said, the government has provided for you can come with the, a helper. So maybe the helper can carry you on a bicycle mm. and you go to the nearest polling station. And then also at the polling station, if you, as she had raised the issue of lining and things like that, mm. uh, this time the Electoral Commission has uh, uh, ensured that when such mm. persons come, they are given affirmative actions, they vote first uh, before the others so that they don't have to line up in the in the sun the person only needs to inform the whoever is at the polling station that i'm a person with disability and then they will give him or her an affirmative action of course this person. is at the polling station Ms. Yes, Guzu. but then yes. the transportation this person from their home to the polling station how will they make that journey if they can't move unfortunately as i said that one has not yet been addressed that's why earlier mm. on i was saying the law needs to be amended that mm. All these helpers should be provided for, or should be facilitated by electoral commission at all levels. So that one is still a big challenge. So the only way they can uh, be able to benefit is to go with the helper. Maybe the helper mm -hmm. takes him on a, a bicycle or a motorcycle. Uh, much as there is social distancing, I'm sure uh, affirmative action has to be put there because now if I'm a, somebody who wants to go and vote and I am not able to move, uh, you can't insist that there should be social distancing. But affirmative action can be provided that this person goes and votes with the helper. Mm. Yes. Let me also bring in Miss Florence Nightingale Mukasa. We would also like to know what your views are on the scientific nature of the election? What should government do to actually alleviate the suffering of people living with disabilities at this point when we are uh, grappling with a COVID-19 pandemic? What should government be doing to actually make sure that uh, all PWDs exercise their constitutional rights during this electoral period? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, moderator. Uh, I think the electoral commission is responsible to facilitate transport and also probably the first set you from where you sleep with the uh, helpers and uh, interpreters but uh, uh, people uh, like we said people who are standing in lines it is a big challenge with us people with disabilities. Uh, with this scientific elections, and, and we, we only don't think about the elections, but there are many, many, many issues. For example, even in church, You know, during this time of uh, scientific church, scientific everything, we have been left out in everything. But also our spirits need, need to be connected to God. You know, some of us even shed tears, uh, and we are thinking that everybody has forgotten us. Uh, let, let me get this uh, straight, uh, uh, Flores. You want government to reopen churches so that you can go back to pray. So you can go back, not really opening churches, yes. but what I'm saying, mm. during these scientific times, of course, churches, mosques, everything was closed. Yes. But some of the churches have been using TVs. Some have been using televisions to pray. Yeah. And even Muslims, we have seen them on TVs praying. But they have completely forgotten us. Who, especially us who are not able to hear. Oh, yes. Go uh, ahead. Some of us, some of you have witnessed this. Mm -hmm. And we get very disappointed when many churches don't take care of, of us and when they forget us. 
I see. But uh, thank God for his grace, uh, the Archbishop mm. for Church of Uganda he has been having an interpreter during the service. It is again our request to other religious leaders, please let us have interpreters when you are having these services on television. We also want to know God. We want to know our God. So now to the Minister of Health. Mm -hmm. Minister of Health has a lot of messages on COVID. But surprisingly, we don't see interpreters during these messages. They talk about scientific, they talk about this and this, but we don't understand anything. So also our request is that uh, to Minister of Health, uh, Permanent Secretary, please, sometimes you're giving out messages. Let us have interpreters so that we are, everybody is on board and we are able to understand. We also want to know COVID, we want to protect ourselves. And now my biggest fear are for elections. As we, have to we are talking about social distance. Yes. Uh, some of us do not understand social distance. Mm. So because information is not clear to us, and how shall we follow this even during the elections? If we do not know, if, if we are not aware, then how shall we adhere? So what we want, electoral commission, let that information be accessible to us. Let that information be accessible mm. to us. Leave no one behind. Florence Nightingale Mukasa calling upon the Electoral Commission not to leave any persons with disabilities out of this electoral race. Uh, let me also bring in Ms. Uh, Guzu uh, Beatrice, the Executive Secretary for the National Council for People Living with Disabilities. We would like to know how COVID-19 has affected government's efforts uh, in trying to help people with disabilities. How has COVID-19 disrupted those efforts? I uh, thank you so much. Mm. Um, one of the things I think is um, the issue of data. Mm. Uh, right now, we only have estimates of the numbers of persons with disabilities as provided by the uh, 2014 population census of UBAS and also the disability survey w which was done. But the, as I said, there are estimates so in terms of knowing actually where persons which disability is where in which village and parish that one is not yet known i think that is one of the reasons why uh, some of the responses are not implemented effectively um then the other issue is also that uh, some of the government officials especially those on the national task force uh, they are not aware of all the categories of persons with disabilities most of them only know maybe physical, blind, deaf, but they don't know other categories which are uh, included in the, in the Persons with Disabilities Act 2020, like persons with albinism, uh, little persons, the ones that we were referring to, uh, then persons with the psychosocial disabilities, all those categories, they are not aware. So for them, they think once they have maybe addressed Persons with physical disabilities, they have already dealt with all persons with disabilities. Uh, that information also, they need to, to get it very uh, clearly. Mm. Uh, then maybe also the other thing is um, the ap appreciation of the cost implications in relation to disability. Mm. Uh, you know, most some of the things for persons with disabilities to be included require uh, extra cost. And if you don't appreciate that, then you will not be able to, you will, you will always brush it off. You will say, ah, this one is too expensive. Let's do away with it. So I think as government, we need to appreciate that if you want to address disability inclusion, you must not target to cost. Because if inevit inevitably, you will have to uh, endure cost. Let me give you an example. Um, now, right now, we said we have members of parliament who are persons with disabilities. There are five of them. Recently, parliament bought uh, iPads 
for members of parliament and the ordinary member of parliament is the iPad was costing, I don't know whether it is 10 million or something, but for the person with a visual impairment, for example, they had to order a special one which has an assistive device and it costed 30 million. So you can't say that now we are not going to facilitate her because hers is more than doubles or triples for others. Then you would have not made her to work. So that is what I'm saying. You mm. We need to appreciate that dis with disability, a cost is a must. Mm. So then uh, that is when we can be able to uh, do well yes. in terms of responses. Of course, Beatrice, uh, mm. people with disabilities depend on small income generating activities. Yes. Now, as we instituted a lockdown to stop the spread of COVID-19, many of these people uh, lost their livelihoods because mm. they could not sustain their livelihoods through work. <laughs> First of all, yes. what is government doing to help such people at this time mm. of need? Yeah, right now, uh, I think there is a program which uh, some of you might be knowing, which is called the Special Grant for Persons with Disabilities. It has been in existence since 2010. Um, but now it was implemented by local governments, which is still actually there, but uh, an extra budget was allocated with uh, and now it is being implemented at two fronts in local governments and also within the ministry of gender which groups of persons with disabilities can ask access that money and engage in income generating activities but secondly still ministry of gender is implementing uh, a social protection program actually it is uh, money which they give for older persons i think most of you are also aware about that the 25000 shillings per month so it also benefits older persons with the disabilities uh, during this COVID. Uh, but also the other programs which are mainstream, like the, the Youth Livelihood, uh, the Women Fund, all those, they have uh, specific budgetary estimates for persons with disabilities. Although those mainstream ones, the challenge is, it comes now to the implementers, they may discriminate against persons with disabilities. But otherwise, uh, it is inclusive as well. Um, then uh, I think in, rel in relation to economic empowerment, those are the, the, the key programs for government currently. All right. Let me also bring in Rose Achayo, the uh, chairperson, board of directors at the National Union of Women with Disabilities of Uganda. Let's talk about what you as development partners are doing to help people with disabilities and how COVID-19 has affected those efforts moving forward. Go ahead. Maybe okay. Maybe goes ahead. <coughs> and one important thing. Go ahead. Uh, persons with disabilities also have formed a national circle mm. for persons. You know, persons with disabilities also don't want to get only free things. Mm. They want to save. So they have formed a national circle for persons with disabilities. But uh, this circle, the operation was somehow halted by COVID. But uh, after COVID, they are going to resume it. <coughs> and uh, they are going to sell that circle to the Ministry of um, Microfinance so that it can uh, support them in terms of lit uh, financial literacy training and things like that. Mm. Ro Rose, let's talk about how COVID-19 has affected your efforts to help people at this time of need, especially people living with disabilities. How has COVID-19 hampered your progress? Okay, thank you so much. I I first of all want to appreciate what government has tried to do. Indeed. But I think government still needs to do much more mm. because uh, persons with disabilities are really... Such as? Is, yes. More such as? Injecting more funding to ensure that employment and social economic empowerment of persons with disabilities are really increased. Mm. Uh, she has talked about uh, data. Data is something which is very key. And I think government needs to really come out clearly and get the total number of persons with disabilities in terms of their gender, in terms of their age. We need to know how many children are there, how many men are there, how many m women are there, and then how many people with physical disabilities. This will enable the government to plan properly. So for me, I think that is very, very key. Mm. Of course, what have we done as Nuwodu? We have always tried to do, as an advocacy organization, we have always tried to do advocacy. Government, this is where issues are. How do you help us solve it? 
policies are there, but now the issue of implementation is still a big challenge. So for us, we have been depending on the development partners. And one of the things that we have now seen is that we need to see how have these women been struggling with their businesses. Is there a way that we can put something to boost that business? Or if the business has, has gone off completely, is there a way we can give some little capital to ensure that they again start a new life? So for us, with the support from the development partners, we have been assessing some of these women, identifying them, assessing uh, exactly what do they need so that we are able to give them some little capital. But as you know, a disabled people's organizations depend on development partners. And these monies that they give us may not be able to really give to every disabled person here in Uganda. So what we are doing is really to show to government that government can still come to aid and say, for example, they are talking about uh, giving loans to people's, people whose businesses have, have, have gone down. So now what is happening with persons with disabilities? Can government also come out with something that you know we are giving these people loans because these ones are really having small, small businesses. They should also be thinking about these persons with disabilities so that they are able also to continue having something that they can do every day for a living. Mm. So for us, we are doing something like helping the few women with disabilities that we have identified, mm. but not in the whole country. Mm. We may just be identifying like, for example, COVID has come, but remember the floods also mm. affected people in Kasese, mm. in actually Renzori region. Mm. So we may be trying to help people from there and some other few districts. Yeah. And then also helping these women who, are, who, are, who have also got issues with gender-based <laughs> violence so that they are able may, to, start, to start a new living by engaging themselves. Because when somebody is busy doing something, psychologically that person is able to forget even the problems that she might have gone through. So we are trying also to identify those ones who are victims so that we engage them, mm. we, 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 we engage them and start asking them what is it that you can do so that every day you are able to occupy your minds instead of thinking of the other ones. So Indeed. That is and now we are dealing with a global pandemic. How mm -hmm. has it affected your progress as Nuwadu? Of course it has affected us badly because all the times that we were in the lockdown, some of the things that we were supposed to, have, uh, we were supposed to be doing, it stalled. And because of that, they had, the staff had to do replanning and which replanning now have to address what is now there as per now. So, but also the funding opportunities has also gone down because many people are now seeing how do we help people with the COVID. Uh, there are many things that are really needed in terms of uh, supporting government uh, so that they are able to manage the situation. Mm -hmm. But not also only that, we are in the COVID situation, how are we handling, how are we prepared, even with the development partners, in terms of the post-COVID? Mm. Because that is now something which is very, very, very key. Indeed. So these, the, these are the disabled people's organizations purely <coughs> depend on those other development partners to really give. But also the development partners mm. are giving to disabled people's organizations and other civil society organizations, mm. but also sometimes there's, there's, there are others who deal with the government, like the Beatrices. They said, now for you, you are doing this. This is what we are giving you. Minister of Gender, this is what we are giving you. So you find that the resources that is there may be very, very meager, but we still have to share it. Mm. Yeah. Well, that is Rose Achayo, the chairperson, board of directors at the National Union of Women with Disabilities of Uganda. Of course, at the height of the pandemic, government continued to give out messages, but these messages were not only in, in disability inaccessible form, but they were also on platforms like televisions and radios that were so, so expensive or inaccessible to many of the people living with disabilities. At this point in time, we would like to talk about the recommendations. What can be done to help persons with disabilities moving forward yes you who's watching at some point you have to take your business online yes you who's watching again you have to take your work online yes your businesses your relationships and so forth continue to move as the pandemic progressed you went online 
but technology did so little for people living with disabilities. So right now, I'd like to talk about recommendations all the same. Let me start with you, Florence Nightingale Mukasa. In your personal opinion or assessment, okay, what are some of the recommendations that should be considered to help alleviate the suffering of people living with disabilities? Mm, yeah, thank you so much, moderator. Uh, in uh, my view, I would uh, recommend, uh, for example, uh, as a uh, government, uh, Beatrice talked about the special grant for people with disabilities. But this grant uh, goes through the district. And the CDOs are really tough. They even say to, to approve you, they would want something. Maybe they want 10% of this money. We as people with disabilities, we are the poorest of the poor. And we need this money. We don't have money to bribe the CDOs. So, my recommendation in that regard, government must follow up. As they say, uh, it, money is given in groups. But again, this is COVID. We are talking about social distance. Now, again, how shall we form these groups? Challenge. So I'm requesting government to monitor this grant. And for accessibility, uh, making information uh, disability friendly, government must work hand in hand mm. with our organizations. Uh, for example, Nuodu, uh, Nudipu, and other organizations mm. work hand in hand with us because we know our disabilities and we know where, where people with disabilities are. And we can reach out unto them. Uh, even now, we do have some WhatsApp groups as mm -hmm. people with disabilities. We use, sub, we use Facebook to sensitize our people. So government work hand in hand with our organizations of people with disabilities. Okay, thank you. The organizations very much, Mary. will mm. be able to reach out to mm. our people and give Indeed. information. Indeed. In that way, things will be easy. Indeed. So, ideally, what Florence is saying have at least <clears throat> one person living with a disability at many positions of power because they know best what the problems of P PWDs are. So if you do not have a PWD on the National COVID-19 Task Force, you're not doing them any service at all. Thank you very much, uh, Florence Nightingale Mukasa. I do have a minute or two for each Beatrice and uh, Rosa Chayo for you to give us your recommendations. Let me start with Ms. Uh, Guzu Beatrice. Recommendations from government. Before I go to recommendation, I wanted just to clarify. We, we that might not have time. Okay. They're like five minutes. <laughs> but if you okay. can do it chap chap. Yes, mm. I'm going to do it chap chap. I was just clarifying on the special grant mm. that now it is implemented at the national level as well. Mm. And the groups have been reduced to five members. So even within a small location, you can be able to apply. Mm. Uh, then giving the recommendations, as I said, one of the ways is we need to come up with a, a comprehensive strategy on how to include disability mm -hmm. in the COVID-19 responses. Then re in relation to ICT, uh, there is a, a national policy on ICT and persons with disabilities, which was developed by Minister of ICT, so that he policy should be implemented comprehensively. Mm -hmm. I think those are the two recommendations I can give. And uh, Ms. Rosa Chayo. Okay, mine, I also have two. First of all, we know the special grant is there, but that special grant still is very little. Government still needs to increase more mm. money. If that's, that money is to make, to change the livelihoods of persons with disabilities. But for me, I, the other recommendation is basically on uh, there are these invisible uh, persons with disabilities with multi, multiple disabilities that are really in the, at home, that they cannot do anything. I think government needs to rethink on uh, the social protection Maybe we need to uh, get data for such persons with disabilities 
And as government is able to transfer cash to older persons, mm -hmm. we need government also to come out with a policy to start transferring cash to some of these disabled people who cannot get out of their homes. They are just there and they cannot do anything, but the caretakers can do something. Well, for what will it take rooms. to make this a reality, Rose? It can, it can happen. What if will it take? One, one we need to identify, government needs to come out with the data, a system where they can be able to identify such persons with disabilities, put them in the system, like the way we now know how many older persons are there. We ca they can work with us disabled people. We mm -hmm. identify those persons with disability. Those who are ever lying on, the, on, 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 on their bed, they cannot get up to do anything, but the caregivers are there looking after them. Those are the ones that we put them in the system, and government should be able every month to transfer some cash to, the, to them so that they also start living a decent life. And? Yeah. That's it? Yes. Okay, Rose Achayo, very, very great submission that she is the chairperson, uh, board of directors at the National Union of Women with Disabilities of Uganda. And in the middle, we did have Miss Beatrice Guzu. She's the executive secretary uh, for the National Council for Persons Living with Disabilities. And right here, I do have the very beautiful Miss Florence Nightingale Mukasa. Yes, she is a social worker. She's a community trainer. She's also a counselor on HIV and AIDS issues, and she's also a member of the International AIDS Society. Ms. Nightingale did lose her sense of her hearing at the age of seven after contracting meningitis. Okay, there you have it. We also did have Olivia, yes, who was assisting Ms. Um, Nightingale Florence, and overall, to crown it all, we did have Maureen Nambalirwa on sign language, doing what she does best. And my name is Romy Busiku. This, the conversation today has been largely centered around the assessment of the COVID-19 pandemic on women and uh, girls with disabilities. Go out there and make it happen. Information is power. Have yourselves a blessed day.